I'm going to tell you exactly everything I know on how to become a cloud engineer. And I don't want you to take these videos that you're going to become an incredible skilled engineer by the end of it. And if you follow what I tell you, I want you to understand that you'll become a junior, which is what you need to be to enter the industry. You are not going to become a fully fledged cloud engineer by following an online roadmap and doing home learning. What you really need to focus on is mastering the basics. And that's exactly what I'm going to explain to you in this video. Now, what I want you to do before you even step into cloud, before you even take a look at the AWS Cloud Practitioner or the Azure Fundamentals or the Solutions Architect or the Azure Administrator, is understand the fundamentals of computing. Now, those fundamentals are going to be virtual machines, databases, networking, storage, and identity and access. Once you have mastered all of those and you have a good fundamental knowledge of those, you can then move on to cloud. Because if you don't have that basic knowledge of how computing actually works already, how that is implemented within the cloud is going to be slightly different and overwhelm you. Now, how can you learn all of those different technologies? Well, you can take the comps here A plus if you want to, or you can do stuff at home, you know, create a Linux virtual machine, create a few Linux virtual machines on a home network, lock them down with some security practices, understand how to manipulate a virtual machine, how to maneuver yourself around, connect a database to it and set up a basic web application. And all of that is going to cover a lot of those fundamentals. And, you know, even in Linux, if you can set up identity and access for both secure and down user accounts, it gives you that fundamental knowledge of the practices of what you're actually going to be doing once you're working on cloud. Now, once you've done that, you need to choose a cloud provider. Now, I recommend choosing a cloud provider that is actually in demand in the area you live. Look, not everyone works remotely. I know some people want to get into tech because they want to work from home, but that's not always the case. Sometimes you are going to be hybrid. Sometimes you're going to be in the office. Now, if you choose to learn Azure, and then three months down the line, once you finished all your learning, you find out it's not actually that in demand in your area as compared to AWS, you've already made a mistake. Now, the next part is crucial and a lot of people would not tell you to do this. So let's go with the example that you've chose to use AWS. Now, most people will go ahead and do the AWS Cloud Practitioner. It's gonna teach you what the services are that AWS provides across many of the different frameworks. Now, some people will then tell you, well, go and take this certification. And I'm going to tell you not to do that. Do not waste your time. Largely, the AWS Cloud Practitioner is not a technical exam. You aren't really going to learn anything apart from what the services actually are. Once you've learned what the services are, what they do to that really basic knowledge level, go take the Solutions Architect Associate Learning and then take that certification. Because that certification actually holds some value. And one of the reasons I'm also telling you to do this is that I don't want you to waste your own money because you don't need to. To put it in simple terms for you, the cloud practitioner, they get sales guys at tech companies to take that just so they understand more about AWS. You know, you even have recruiters taking it so they can understand more about what services are offered so they can understand how to speak to potential clients. It is not something that you need a certification in. It's mainly a cash cow for AWS because impressionable people We'll go ahead and take that exam. I think they can land the job. That's not how it works. Now, once you've taken the Solutions Architect Learning, you've passed the exam, someone with no experience, it's probably going to take you at least two months, maybe maybe one month if you're very good and you're really picking things up. And whilst you've taken that exam, what you want to be doing is creating a free AWS free tier account and deploy some resources to AWS. So make sure you actually understand how to deploy them. And I want you to do this all manually to begin with. And the reason I want you to do this all manually is because of the next step when you go on to do infrastructure as code, which I recommend Terraform, it's going to make a lot more sense when you're actually writing Terraform. Now there, briefly leading on to my next point, is you need to smash your learning with Terraform. Although there's been speculation of people maybe switching away from Terraform because IBM bought them out, I strongly believe that is not going to happen. Look, I work in consulting. I have done for the past three years. All of the clients that are massive enterprises are not going to switch from Terraform to something like Open Tofield. They're more than likely, they would switch to the cloud native products like CloudFormation or Bicep, which again, probably isn't going to happen because no one really wants to use them. Now, when you're working as a cloud engineer, most of the work you're going to be doing is on Terraform. So you need to be good at it. And the benefits of Terraform is that it's very easy to read and it's very easy to write. And I personally believe if someone learned Terraform from scratch without any coding experience, they could start picking up fundamentals and the basics within three to four weeks and start deploying resources to a cloud provider and creating their own custom modules. And I'm not just saying that because I'm trying to sell that to you, like you should go ahead and do that. I genuinely believe that Terraform is that easy to read and write. It can be a pain in the ass, it can be a little bit annoying, 
sometimes, but you can figure it out a lot with Google and with ChatGPT now. And the Terraform registry is amazing. There's a huge community behind Terraform and the documentation that HashiCorp provide will enable you to be able to really learn about Terraform. Now, once you've got that all done, okay, you've done your solutions architect associate, you've done manual click ops work, deploying resources to AWS, you figured out how to use Terraform. What do you do next? Well, you really need to focus on delivering projects and creating your own mini projects at home that hold some value to what it's actually like in the real world as a cloud engineer. Now, the best project I like to say is not stupid things like go create a Lambda, you know, go and deploy an EC2. I want you to incorporate as much as the tech stack into your project as possible. So for example, let's say you have a web application. Let's say it's a two-tier web application. I want you to go into Terraform. So create your basic web application, you know, whatever you want to do it with, you know, JavaScript, HTML, CSS, just don't pull up a basic one online. You don't need to understand that language specifically. It's just so you know what you're doing. Now I want you to create a network. Now when you create the network, you're going to create a VPC. You're going to create the subnets. You're going to create the route tables. You're going to create the network ranges and you're going to understand how to deploy a network. That's one of the stacks. And then what you're going to do is you're going to deploy your virtual machines. You're going to pick your Linux distribution, let's just say it's Ubuntu, and you're going to deploy those Linux virtual machines. You can have them in public and private subnets. And I want you to deploy those virtual machines and have your web application configured. And what you can do with Terraform is you could have it all configured to run on launch. You could create your own bash script or something like that, or just create any form of script and have that embedded into the virtual machine. Or you could create an image and put it on there. Now, once that's done, you create your security groups and you can secure those virtual machines, secure the network with knuckles if you wanted to also. So that's security and you've got your virtualization covered. You also need to think about how much storage do those machines need to have. You know, your application could be right into your machine. You could have a database configured locally on it. You could create a free tier web application and have a database that also needs data and storage. You need to know how that works. And then I want you to actually be able to load up that web application on the front end. And you could create a load balancer, which load balances all of that. I want you to do all of that project manually. Make sure you understand it. You understand the fundamentals of what you're doing. And then I want you to delete everything. Delete all of that. Go and deploy it with Terraform. De deploy it with the infrastructure as code again. And moving on to the next step, you need to know how to put all of this into a CI/CD pipeline. That's another element of a cloud engineer stack. We will be editing pipelines regularly. And a lot of those pipelines are going to be for Terraform. So then add it into a pipeline. And then if you want to take it into another step forward, what you can then do is containerize that application that you've built. So put it into Docker and then deploy it all again. So remove the virtual machines, do it with Docker, and you can now tick off containers and you can tick off Docker. And if you really want to take that extra step forward, implement Kubernetes into it which for a beginner, it's kind of probably going to overwhelm you. Kubernetes is a separate beast on its own. But as you can see, what I'm kind of explaining you to do here is build projects where you use all of the stack. And the reason for that is because you're hitting all of the technologies in one project and you can talk about them as much as you can. You know, when you apply to jobs, if you get to an interview process, they're going to query you on it. And then you can talk about the struggles you had, how you overcome them, what benefits you saw and the way you delivered your project. And that's something that hiring manager is really going to like and show how motivated you are. But how many of those projects do I actually think you're going to need? Well, I don't think there is a definitive number, but if you think of three good ones, look up some online, try to replicate them, but don't just blindly copy someone's work. Just get the idea, go and do it. If you get stuck, go back to the original documentation because that's the thing you learn. You don't learn just by following step after step after step. You learn by doing something, it breaking, you try to fix it. You can't figure it out. You use resources like Google, ChatGPT, Stack Overflow. If you really don't know, go back to the original documentation. And the other really important thing to do is actually showcase your work online. You know, don't sit in the silence at home. No one knows about what you're actually doing. You know, post it on LinkedIn, create a GitHub, share your GitHub portfolio onto LinkedIn every time you create a new project. And then go ahead and look out for these junior positions and keep applying to them. You know, update your CV, make sure your CV looks very good. Have the list of technologies at the top. Have any transferable skills from any previous employment. Now really go ahead with it, you know. And don't forget to optimize your LinkedIn. I have a video on that. If you want to go ahead and watch it, go check that out. Now the real question that everybody wants to know is how long is this going to take? How long do I need to keep doing this until I land a job? Now in the current market, this isn't just technology, you know, this is every industry. The job market is definitely not amazing. 
but I do have followers in my community and even in my Discord, and they are still landing jobs without any experience for junior positions. These have been in the UK and in the US. Now, the shortest person we had landed a job was three months, but most of them are averaging between the six to 12 month mark range. Now, some of those people did home projects, some of them did internships, some of them volunteered for people. Now, if you're in the UK and you're unemployed or you are in a position where you're out of work, the UK actually offers, the UK actually offers government boot camps where they will fund your training to go on a boot camp. And then once you finish that boot camp, you can apply to a job. We also have people who have paid for their own boot camps. Now, I always stress the importance of trying not to spend all of your money and putting your eggs into one basket. So go ahead and try things at home first. See what you can learn. So you really might surprise yourself after one to two months of what you're capable of doing and what you've actually learned. Using all of my knowledge that I've built up working in cloud in the last three years and the previous seven years, which I've worked in technology for 10 years in different roles. And that is how I think you should land a job in technology from zero experience. I've worked in cloud for three years, I've worked in technology for 10 years overall. And if I had someone come to me and just blindly apply for a job as a junior position without doing any of those things that I just said, your CV would be completely ignored. And that's the harsh reality of the industry. It is very cutthroat and there is a lot of competition. So if you're not doing everything to stand out against all of the other people that want to get into technology without experience, and you need to remember you're competing with boot camp graduates and university graduates. I wish you all the best on your journey. Don't forget to like and subscribe.